Well, that was awfully hideous yesterday. Good morning. Welcome in. Let's uh, forget about that Broncos game and move on to Germany next weekend where the Chiefs play uh, the Dolphins, of course. We're going to forget that ever happened yesterday in Denver. My mom used to say, if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say anything. But I'm not going to re- follow that advice today. Okay. All right. Fair <laughs> enough. Well, it's a Monday morning, and um, it is good to be here on KCMO Talk Radio. But, yeah, that was... Good um, to be anywhere warm, right? <laughs> yeah, mm-hmm. That's true. Sure. That's true. And it's not here in Kansas City. It's 28 degrees, at least it was when I was coming in this morning. And uh, the Chiefs looked miserable as uh, the Broncos finally snapped a 16-game losing streak that dates back to September of 2015. I mean, my goodness. Trump wasn't even president the last time (laughs) the uh, Chiefs had lost a game to the Broncos. So that was a tough one to swallow. Now, I guess Patrick Mahomes uh, was sick, obviously, yesterday. If you watch the broadcast, you know that. And here's, as I was watching the game, I'm, I'm thinking about this. Like, I've got a sick wife at home, and she can't speak right now. It's sinusy. It's, uh, you know, all that stuff. It's a bad, bad, nasty cold. And as someone who talks for a living, I'm like, geez, i got to do what I can to make sure I don't get this, right? Well, here's a quarterback who literally has to be healthy 20 days a year. That's it. I mean, you know, 17 in the regular season, hopefully a couple of playoff games. He's got to be healthy 20 games a year. And I'm following Mark's social media because – Mark's tweeting yesterday about how, what, I guess Brittany had Instagram videos up of the kids being sick all week, and she got the flu bug as well. Is that what you saw on her social media pages? Yes, she was showing us uh, the diarrhea from Patrick LeVon Mahomes III, oh. and uh, I know they didn't report that on the TV, but I did hear them reporting my tweet without actually giving me credit. Well, of <laughs> course, yes. Well, here's the thing. Um, there was a lot of diarrhea on the field yesterday. It just came in a different form. That's That was one big game of diarrhea, as I was watching yesterday. Mahomes clearly was not himself, and obviously his illness had something to do with it. I guess his symptoms were worst on Saturday night, but you're talking about playing a day later, less than 24 hours, at that kind of elevation? Uh, that's a tough spot, but to get to my point here, I don't understand how you've got a guy who has to be healthy 20 days a year, who's making 40 mil, I respect he's around his family. I respect him being a family man. But you got to get this guy in the quarantine if your son's got diarrhea three days before a game, John. Hopefully the new digs out there apparently doesn't have a safe room, you know, like the Jody Foster play. I guess not. Some because to go there in the house. And somewhere to go. the meals through them. I mean, if I can avoid my family, not that I'm trying to do that at all. We had a full weekend. But mm-hmm. if I can, like, keep my distance a little bit, from a spouse or a sick kid just because of what I do and wanting to be here every day and be able to speak and speak coherently, then how does the guy who's making 40 mil as the quarterback not be like, hey, kids got diarrhea, you're all getting sick, Uh, I'm going to the west wing of the house. Going to Travis's house. (laughs) Taylor's out of town. Taylor's out of town. She's going down to South America. Do it that way. That's the thing that I'm continuing to struggle with as I watched yesterday unfold. Travis was also out of town. <laughs> yeah, uh, maybe you're right. Fine. But see, he was out of town, too. So go. Go to a hotel. All right? I mean, the, you know, the guy can afford a hotel. Quentin Lucas will take the hotel tax downtown as well. But sheesh, that was ugly. Boy, it sure was. And, of course, he's not the only one to blame. There. No. And that's where I was going with my ex had story. Uh, I, uh, no. Give me, a, mm-hmm. give me a good 20-second rant here, John, to start the show. What's your rant? Get it off your this chest. This season will end in tears, right? And none of the mistakes that showed up yesterday are new, right? The guy's dropping the balls and all that stuff. Mahomes will have time, and then he won't hit somebody, or the guys won't separate from their defenders. So we've got a bunch of guys that can't get open and can't catch when they are open. I'm uh, mm-hmm. disappointed in Rashi Rice. I was hoping that had gone away, but boom, there it was. It yep. an opportune time. Yep. Sky Moore, you've had a couple of years. Yeah. MVS, you're getting paid. I totally agree with that assessment. MVS and Sky Moore and Rashi Rice. All and Mahomes is yelling at MVS. He's like, come back to the ball. <laughs> it's fundamental receiving. You should have learned that in high school. Oh man, I totally agree. All right. Mark, mark it down. Uh, six oh nine. 
on Monday, October 30th. John Anthony predicting the season will end in tears. Now, he didn't clarify what kind of tears, but I assume it was right, not good right. tears. Hey, Buffalo and Cincinnati have delayed these same eggs. Yep. But when the Chiefs get punched in the mouth, they seldom have an answer in the Andy Reid era. Yeah, okay. All right. You know, we don't have a running game. We ought to be able to move some earth with those three guys in the center. I and agree. They need to get on that. I so agree. I don't know what happened in the playbook, but let's get some new ones. Mm-hmm. So the Chiefs, of course, they're going to go to Germany uh, on Sunday, take on the Dolphins, then a bye week, and then it's Monday night against the Eagles. And that one could be ugly. <laughs> Let's mm-hmm. get this thing turned around. If they beat the Dolphins, though, their sole possession of first place in the AFC again. So maybe not all is lost yet. No, yeah, definitely not all is lost. Just got to start cleaning no, it up. But oh. those mistakes have appeared more than once. Yep. Six and two, baby. Still first place in the AFC West. Uh, they are still going to lock up the division. There's no doubt about that. But yeah, when you got the expectations of a Super Bowl, that was some egg that was laid yesterday. Now, before the game, the Kansas City Star laid its own egg. The difference is they do that on a daily basis here in town. Um, this is like a quarterly thing. I, I've joked about this, but I actually think it's true. You are required, if you write for the Kansas City Star on the editorial board, once a quarter to write a piece about how the Chiefs are a bad name, we shouldn't say the word Chiefs, the Chiefs should say their name or change their name, and that's exactly what you got yesterday. Sunday morning, Toriano Porter headline, home of the Chiefs question mark, stop disrespecting national anthem, Kansas City football fans. I love how they write that, too, in the headline. Kansas City football fans. By the way, what a dumb time to write the article for a road game. Like, if you're going to write this article, write it before a home game. Not a road game when the home of the Chiefs thing is not even going to happen. That just makes no sense to me. Oh, I just love it when liberals demonstrate their patriotism. (laughs) Uh, Toriano Porter, who used to cover news in town, but then, you know, he was too busy... What was he doing? Yelling at the truck drivers in Lee Summit or Independence or something like that, and they had to apologize on his behalf. Anyway, he writes here, I'm considering protesting Sunday's Chiefs game in Denver by taking a knee during the singing of the national anthem. You should join me. Any God-fearing, America-loving, flag-waving patriot should. So clearly he's writing this tongue-in-cheek. These people that write for the Kansas City Star are not God-fearing. They don't believe in God. They don't love America. They hate America. They are embarrassed by America. And they certainly would never call themselves patriots. That's a dirty word in the eyes of these individuals. So this is clearly written right out of the gates as tongue-in-cheek, as sarcastic, as not serious. Porter goes on the note, this form of protest apparently is my only recourse to address a long-standing gripe I have with Chiefs fans, decades-long tradition of debasing the Star-Spangled Banner. Please. All, all of a sudden now, this guy's concerned about the Star-Spangled Banner. They don't care about any other American tradition. But when they can dump on the Chiefs and Chiefs fans, they will pretend like they care about patriotism. That racist song? Have you read the second stanza? <laughs> Have you read the third verse? <laughs> The National Anthem Porter writes belongs to America, not to Kansas City football fans. And then, of course, they are asking Mahomes and Kelsey and Taylor Swift to come together to put an end to this tired act. You know, I wish that Mahomes and Kelsey and Swift would put an end to the tired act that is the Kansas City Star pretending to be a newspaper when it's just left-wing hackery spun differently every single day and well not every single day because now the paper's only six days a week and it's printed up in iowa so my bad that's what i wish mahomes kelsey and swift would put an end to or maybe you know what maybe they could do they could actually invest they could pull a jeff bezos invest in a real newspaper that this community and this city deserve Not the pretend one that is really just uh, opinion and activism masked as journalism. That would be a nice thing for Mahomes, Kelsey, and uh, Taylor Swift. (laughs) Travis Swift. (laughs) 
to get behind. <laughs> it's a Monday morning. It's 615. Welcome in. Thanks for being here on KCMO Talk Radio. We're going to get through it, all right? We're going to get through it after yesterday's ugly, ugly game in Denver. Uh, speaking of ugly, coming up next, uh, Robert Card, thank goodness, is dead. That was the man um, that was involved in that mass shooting up in Maine. But, of course, people could not avoid the politics of this. We'll tell you who, where, and why coming up on KCMO, now on FM at 95.7. You may have missed it over the weekend, but uh, Robert Card, the scumbag who shot up the bar in the bowling alley last week in Lewiston, Maine, was uh, found dead late on Friday night. About 8 p.m. Friday night, um, he was found with a self-inflicted gunshot wound by a dumpster near a recycling plant in Libson Falls, Maine. Uh, police did not give an exact location at the time, but obviously uh, that part of the country can rest easy knowing that he is no longer, of course, at large and out there after his murdering of a dozen and a half people a week ago on Wednesday. So uh, what you had coming out of this, and, and I feel like this is something where it was a huge news story last week for obvious reasons, but then they find him on Friday night, and a lot of people are probably waking up on Monday saying, hey, yeah, whatever happened to that story? Because understandably, people might take a break. They got things going on on Friday night. They're not locked into the news coverage. But this guy was found on Friday night. Um, thank goodness, self-inflicted gunshot wound. He can't hurt anybody else. Um, but... Of course, immediately after, what did you have happening? Well, you had the politics getting involved, sad to say. So uh, first, we've got Joe Biden's statement. He put out a statement late on Friday, or somebody put out a statement for him. He was definitely asleep by this time. Come on, man. Um, The statement read as follows. Tonight, we're grateful that Lewiston and surrounding communities are safe after spending excruciating days hiding in their homes. He added that Americans should not have to live like this and called on Congress to take action on gun violence. Now, live like what? When Joe Biden says live like this, what does that mean? There should not be any guns that get sold that are owned around the United States. I mean, what? what? And this is the same old story we have every time Someone tries to politicize one of these. Tell me what law you're passing that prevents Robert Card from doing what he did. He was in the Army Reserve. We know that he had mental health issues. He was hearing things over the summer. He went away for a couple of weeks. Apparently, he was being told, he claims, by these voices to uh, shoot up the place he had been working the Army Reserve Complex he had been working at. But you've got to give me something concrete. Instead, you just get these rambly, feel-good, mean-nothing statements from people saying, well, do something. Uh, Okay, like what? Such a cute sound. Do what? Why don't you lead the way, Mr. President, since you've got the ideas on how to keep Americans safe, apparently. I mean, can't keep us safe from much. Inflation, border, whatever. But apparently you can keep us safe from guns in the hands of bad guys. So tell us what that looks like. Give us something to work with, Mr. President. Instead of putting out these half-assed statements on a Friday night at 9 o'clock, definitely after your bedtime, and, you know, moving on to the next thing. That's all this feels like. It checked off a box, right? It achieved what he needed to achieve saying he's against gun violence because, yeah, I mean, who isn't? (laughs) And give me something to work with here. But he couldn't do it. Couldn't do it. So this guy, Robert Card, was from Bowden, Maine. He was a U.S. Army reservist. And this now becomes um, one of the deadliest shootings in Maine history in a state that had 29 killings all last year. This was obviously 18 Last week, So understandably, it shakes up a community. If that was our community, if that was anywhere close to our homes and our families, obviously that shakes you up. But then if you're going to take the emotion out of it and strip it down to what you want to achieve and what you want to accomplish, you got to give people something a substance. 
Because instead, what's really going on here is taking advantage of vulnerable people who have lost loved ones, who are scared, who are concerned, who are are dealing with a traumatic situation. You are taking advantage of those people and leveraging them for your end result and for your end game when it comes to gun control. That's what you're doing. 913-408-7957 is our studio line and our text line as we get it rolling on a uh, busy Monday morning here on KCMO Talk Radio, now on FM at 95.7. And by the way, we've got Chris Stapleton tickets we're going to be giving away this morning, so don't miss that. Uh, 7.15, we'll do those here on KCMO Talk Radio. He is coming to T-Mobile Arena. Uh, That's going to be in June of next year, so it's right around the corner. 6.27, let's kick it off and say out of Mike. He is in Kansas City. Mike, what do you got for me? Good morning. Uh, Chicago-style gun laws, you know, uh, yes. outlawed the legal possession of guns. You know, Chicago people are safe in their homes or scared in their homes or whatever. But, you know, they're, you, know you have 18 people die in one week in Chicago, you know, but we don't talk about that because that doesn't fit the agenda. That is uh, so true. Um, I- I'm glad you brought that up, Mike. I'm really glad you did because uh, they never give out statements when it comes to Chicago or, heck, here in Kansas City. I mean, my goodness, I saw Quentin Lucas last week, right after the shooting happened up in Maine, he's commenting on it. He's talking about gun violence and gun control. It's like, dude, you got a city here that is trending towards a record number of homicides. We've had 155 in Kansas City this year. The record is 179 set in 2020. And on this date in 2020, we had 156. We are one behind the deadliest year in Kansas City, Missouri history. But don't worry, let's get the tweet out on, um, you know, gun control at the federal level in the wake of something happening 2,000 miles away. That makes sense. 913-408-7957. News coming up in a couple of minutes. Meantime, the latest on the anti-Semitism on the rise here on KCMO. If what was happening to Jews right now was happening to any other group on the planet, it would be getting significantly more attention than it has over the last couple of days. Let me say that at 635 on a Monday. Welcome in. Tough loss, of course, for the Chiefs yesterday. We'll move on to Germany later this week, of course, when they take on the uh, Dolphins Sunday morning, 830 kickoff for that game. But uh, And we'll talk to Kendall Gammon in a half hour about what the heck went wrong there yesterday. But uh, I'm seeing the story last night, and if you haven't seen some of the footage, I mean, it is beyond disturbing, where a flight was going from Israel to uh, Dagestan, which is a heavily Muslim part of Russia. And the flight had to be diverted And there were major security issues at the airport because you had people hunting for the Jews at the airport because they caught wind that this plane was coming in from Israel with Jews. And it was as disturbing as anything you're going to see as people are literally trying to storm the airport to do God knows what to these Jews who they find out had just arrived. Here's what the protest sounded like outside of the airport in Dagestan. I mean, it is just a mass and sea of humanity outside of this airport on the other side of the world. And I'm watching this and, you know, you can't help but be incredibly disturbed by it. And I'm sitting here and I'm thinking to myself, my goodness. And people are calling them protesters. No, that was a mob. That was an angry mob who was there looking for people because of their beliefs and nothing more. And I'm watching this and I'm saying to myself, if this was any other group, 
I mean, they, they wouldn't stop talking about this. And by the way, rightfully so. You have ten, I mean, look, tens of thousands, at the very least thousands, of seemingly Muslim men who are trying to storm an airport because they know that there are Jews on a plane somewhere in that airport. I, that's at the very core what this was. And on top of that, as the story unfolded, um, there was multiple reports saying that there were rioters, these same individuals, who were stopping vehicles and stopping travelers at the airport and allegedly checking their passports to see if they were Jewish. Some of the demonstrators were holding signs that read, child killers have no place in Dagestan. And then also other signs that read, we are against Jewish refugees. The mob allegedly forced some travelers at the airport to denounce Israel on camera and agree that Jewish refugees were not welcome to stay in Dagestan. Israel's foreign ministry said there was no Israeli citizens or Jewish people aboard the flight from Tel Aviv. But other Jewish passengers in the airport at the time were gathered by security and scheduled to be evacuated to Moscow at their earliest convenience. So this plane was supposed to go to another part of Russia, but because of security breaches, they ended up having to go to Dagestan. And that's when the chaos in part ensued. So this, once again, is unfolding right in front of our eyes on the other side of the world. And then some people have the audacity to question the legitimacy and the need for a state like Israel. look Look at what is happening all around them. Whether it's coming from, obviously, the Gaza Strip, whether it is coming from Turkey, from Iran, from, you know, some of these southern parts of Russia. These people are surrounded by countries and bad faith actors and terrorists who want nothing more than to wipe them off the face of the earth. And it's our duty as America, as their ally, to make sure that they have all the resources necessary to know that we are going to stand by them. And that's what new Speaker of the House Mike Johnson said yesterday on uh, Fox Business Network. As I uh, took the gavel, our our work began, and we passed the resolution, as you noted, in, in, uh, in strong support of our strong ally and great friend Israel. We had to do that. And then I flew last night to Las Vegas and spoke to the Republican Jewish Coalition, as you noted, Uh, to to send a further signal that this is a priority for our country and we cannot allow the brutality and the just unspeakable evil that is that is happening against israel right now to continue we're going to stand with our friends that's a new speaker of the house mike johnson on uh, fox business network yesterday so uh, what's going to happen this week is uh, the house is set to vote on a standalone israel bill with a price tag of 14 and a half billion dollars Republicans saying it will be fully paid for, according to people familiar with the call and what they told Politico. Uh, They also revealed plans to move on legislation targeting Iranian oil sales, including putting previous sanctions back into place. Two good things that need to be done. Now, Joe Biden, he wants a $100 billion package, close to that, where far more money goes to Ukraine than goes to Israel. And you can, you can talk me into a little more money for Ukraine. You can. But we're talking, according to Joe Biden, 40 50 $60 billion of funding for Ukraine. And to attach it to Israel, all that does is take advantage of the suffering of Israel and use it to jam through more money for Ukraine. Nobody has put together a plan for Ukraine. That could be a two, five, ten year war. And if you think that the American people and the taxpayers should just keep cutting checks to Ukraine for tens of billions of dollars, well, guess what? People are not feeling that right now. They're not in the mood for that right now. There's a lot of pain and struggle in America today. And while I am much more sympathetic to Ukraine than many people who do this for a living, and I'm willing to support them in large degree, it can't be endless. And as many Republicans have been saying, Mark Alford said it on this show last week, we have not been given a roadmap to what this looks like and what the off-ramp potentially is in the Ukraine-Russia conflict and how we ultimately get people around the table, stop the loss of life, 
stop the insane spending and put an end to this. Nobody has presented that to us from the White House. That was Mark Alford talking about that last week on the show. So until that comes, until somebody says, hey, here's what's going on. Um, Here's how we get out of this. Here's our plan. Until we get something like that, I would be hesitant to just keep dumping tens of billions of dollars into them as well. That doesn't make a lot of sense to me at this point in time. So I'm glad the House is doing this. I, I like this guy, Mike Johnson, a lot. I didn't really know anything about him until his name popped up last week. Republican from Louisiana, who is now the Speaker of the House. Um, but I like the guy. The more I hear from him, he seems like somebody who is conservative, but he's not there for the wrong reasons. He's not there for his ego. He's not there for the hot sound bites and the big takes. That's not what he's there for. He's there to actually get stuff done, and apparently he's fairly well-liked across the aisle, which helps a lot in politics, let's be honest. So I hope they get that thing passed, and then we'll see if the uh, Senate and the White House are able to you know, go along with that and just fund the Israel stuff and then deal with Ukraine separately. Do not attach them at the hip, please. Don't do it. 913-408-7957. That is the uh, studio line. And the text line here on KCMO Talk Radio, 95.7. We got those Chris Stapleton tickets coming up in a half hour. Kendall Gammon is 20 minutes away on KCMO. Coming up, uh, it has been a tough month. If you Don't look at your portfolio. I don't want to give you more bad news on a Monday. I mean, Chiefs lose. I'm telling you to avoid looking at your 401k. But uh, we are wrapping up a tough month in the markets. What are the facts behind that? What's going on? We'll get to it next on KCMO. All right there, John. Who won the uh, Chris Stapleton tickets on day one? Ethan in Kansas City, number five for Chris Stapleton, coming up June 12th at T-Mobile Center. All right. Very well done. Congratulations, Ethan. If you missed out, you can listen to Ray Stevens, 1015 today. And uh, he's got your next pair of tickets every day, 715 and 1015 here on KCMO Talk Radio. Now on FM at uh, 95.7. So, while yesterday was awful for the Chiefs, I will tell you what, uh, Saturday was a very good day if you are a area college football fan, especially KU upsets Oklahoma. They beat them for the first time in 26 years. Uh, you've got Kansas State dominating Houston on Saturday. Mizzou wins again against South Carolina. All our three big schools regionally are ranked. And I asked on Twitter, when's the last time Mizzou, KU, and K-State were ranked in the top 25 in the same week? No one answered the question. I can't find it anywhere, but someone's got to have that somewhere. Last time, those three teams were all in the top 25 of the AP poll. It's got to be, I mean, at least 15. I mean, last time KU was good, obviously, outside of last season was 15 years ago. So it's at least 15 years. Might be more like 20 plus. If it's ever happened, KU, K-State, Mizzou all ranked after great wins over the weekend. But in another part of the country, uh, the story at a college football game was all about a protest. And, of course, it was at UC Berkeley. Of all, I mean, of course, <laughs> of course. <laughs> the only time students there care about football is when they can use it to protest. That's it. That's all they care about. So if you missed it, the USC-Cal game was delayed over protesters sitting on the 50-yard line. Now, I would have started pegging them with footballs, but, you know, that's why I'm just a fan. So here's what happened. Uh, Start of the UC Berkeley game against uh, USC on Saturday was delayed due to a student protest regarding a suspended professor. There's uh, fake news getting pushed out there that this was a Palestinian or pro-Hamas protest or something like that, uh, anti-Israel protest. That's not what this was. So there were some headlines on social media suggesting that this was tied to the uh, Israel-Hamas conflict. It was not. Shortly after the coin toss, protesters wearing T-shirts reading Justice for Yvonne entered the field and sat down at the 50-yard line. And by the way, they just like kind of sat there. It's like, hello, do we have security here? Anybody? Is is someone going to do something about this? I, it's like, let's tap them on the shoulder and, hey, you mind, you guys mind getting up? We got a football game to play. No, you got to forcibly remove them. So eventually they were arrested. But the protesters were uh, referencing one of their professors 
whose ongoing suspension has become the center of a campus controversy. The demonstrators were handcuffed by authorities. The game started 15 minutes late. So this professor was suspended two years ago after stalking and harassing another professor at UC Davis and uh, violated subsequent orders to not contact him. This professor, Yvonne DeVal, admitted to the outlet that she did much of the behavior that she's been accused of, including keying this fellow professor's car, vandalizing the area outside of his apartment, posting an image of his partner online, and contacting his friends and writing messages outside of his mother's home. But for some reason, she claims that she is the victim here and that her actions were the result of her being hacked and not receiving proper support from her university, that being Cal Berkeley. So how classic is this? Somebody gets arrested for doing something wrong, right? You're basically stalking another professor. You are harassing another professor. You are doxing this said professor, posting pictures of his partner online. And then in classic America 2023, what do you get to do? I'm the real victim here. I'm the victim. No, no, see, you've got it all wrong. I'm the victim. Because that's what you can always do in America in 2023. You can claim victim status, even when you're clearly not the victim. If you just say you are, you will find enough people who will say, yeah, yeah, you know what? You're right. You are the one getting screwed here in all this. And apparently she's brainwashed enough of these uh, crazy kids on the Berkeley campus to actually buy into it that two years later, they're sitting at the 50 yard line of a Cal Berkeley game protesting this teacher suspension from going back two years now. By the way, have you seen the attendance at some of these Berkeley games? Nobody goes. The only time students care about football at Cal is when they can protest it for some nonsensical reason at midfield and delay the game. That's the only time those kids care one bit about college football, which is very much on brand and very predictable, but it really is sad. Have fun with that ACC. I'm glad the Big 12 didn't pick up Cal when they were out there floating about looking for a home in a power conference. Because the last thing you want if you're a KU or K-State fan is a delay of game for some nonsensical, you know, woke protest that they've got going on. Well, you take on the football team and the marching band. (laughs) That's right. Going back on the field. Thought the game was over. (laughs) That's a good reference there, John. Mm -hmm. Well done by you. That is uh, classic. So I wanted no part of those schools uh, joining the Big 12. The ACC is going to have to figure out how to deal with that. What? Cal and Stanford are going to the ACC. So have fun. Have fun with that one. But uh, I don't want my football games delayed because of midfield protests before kickoff. I'm a hard pass on that. What I'm not a hard pass on is what Roger Marshall, our Kansas U.S. Senator, said on Fox yesterday about Israel. We'll get to that coming up. All right, Peter, Mike Pence's uh, presidential campaign. I can't even say it with a straight face. Oh, my goodness. There was never a chance that Mike Pence was going to be the GOP nominee. Never any possibility for Mike Pence that he was somehow going to thread the needle and become the nominee in 2024. I think Mike Pence is a very good man. I think Mike Pence would be a pretty solid president. But I can't fathom being as smart of a guy as Mike Pence is and coming to the conclusion that there's any path to you becoming president. That is where all of these individuals have egos that unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on who you ask, but I would say unfortunately supersede their smarts oftentimes. Because when you're Mike Pence and, you know, you know how a lot of the Trump voters feel about you and then you're trying to figure out, okay, can I cobble enough other people together to make me a viable nominee and the answer was always going to be no that's where i don't know if these guys get bored if it really is just ego if it's driven by friends family i don't know but mike pence had no path there was no path on day one and there was no path up to the day that he exited over the weekend 
So uh, good riddance to Mike Pence's presidential campaign. And regardless of how you feel, whether you like Donald Trump or you like one of the other candidates, you should be saying good riddance. Because the Trump people obviously don't like Pence. And if you're looking for an alternative candidate, Pence was just taking from the potential pool of voters. That's all he was accomplishing. That's all he was doing. So I thought he might want to hang on for one more debate. I think the next debate is next uh, Wednesday, I believe. So I I wondered if Mike wanted to have one more debate and just try to light it up. But he wasn't good in the debates anyway. That's the other thing. I mean, one of the things that I like about Mike Pence is he comes across awfully folksy. Like, even if you hate the guy's politics, you could have a beer with Mike Pence. But he was just at the debates. Gosh, he was such a turnoff at those things. He talked over everybody, he acted like a front runner. It was just, he was rude. So if you're Mike Pence and you already don't really have a chance and then you become less likable, that is a bad combo <laughs> when you're trying to become the presidential nominee. So Mike dropped out. He had no path to 2024 success. And over the weekend on Saturday, campaign was low on money and the Republican Party moving in a different direction. He made the announcement at the annual Republican Jewish Coalition Convention in Las Vegas. So he's done. He's out of the mix. And as far as I'm concerned, that's good. At this point, there should only be three people in this race. Donald Trump, Ron DeSantis, and Nikki Haley. That's it. They're the only people who should still be in the race at this point. Frankly, it should probably be two. It should be Trump and one of the others and, you know, give Republican voters an option. But there is no point for more than that. Ramaswamy can go away. I mean, he's a figment of uh, right wing Twitter's imagination. He's got no he says good things, but he's got no chance. Uh, Tim Scott. Goodbye. See you later. Chris Christie. uh, Time for a Big Mac. Goodbye. Doug Burgum. Who? And Asa Hutchinson, go play golf. That's what I would say to each of those remaining candidates. A new NBC News uh, Des Moines Register poll, Iowa, obviously the first primary in the country, put out a poll this morning. It has Trump up 40, or not up 43, but at 43%. DeSantis at 16, Nikki Haley at 16, Tim Scott at seven, Christie at four, Ramaswamy at four, Bergam at three, and Asa Hutchinson at one percent. So I guess Asa Hutchinson must have a couple of uh, distant relatives in Iowa who think he'd make a good president because I don't know who else would put <laughs> the former Arkansas governor down for anything at this point. But listen, Trump's up 25 in Iowa. And if Trump wins Iowa by 25, I mean, it's game, set, match. This thing is over. The riser, though, is Nikki Haley. She is up 10 points from the last poll done in August. She was at 6% in August. She's now at 16. Ron DeSantis, if you want to look at trends, is down 3% from August. He was at 19. He's at 16. Nikki Haley was at 6. She's now at 16. And Trump, by the way, is up one point from August. So Trump's basically even. And this is what we know, right? I mean, Trump's got his 40%. He's got that on lock. Depending on the state, it might be 30, 35, it might be 45, 50, but he's got that lock on, let's call it 40%. That's not changing. We're literally just redoing 2016 all over again. That's all this is. Where all these individuals continue to think they have a chance, most of them don't. They all think that Trump might crash and burn, and instead he's just going to pick things off at 40%, 40%, 40%. Until it's over, except it's going to end a lot faster this time because the guy's already been the president and obviously is firmer on that 40 percent than he was seven years ago. The only hope, the only hope. If you are someone who wants to see a different candidate emerge is that literally everybody drops out except one. And I don't know who that is. Like, Nikki Haley can make the case and say, I'm the Trump alternative because I'm up 10 points in the last two months. Ron DeSantis can say, well, listen, I've got a track record as governor of Florida, being the most effective governor in the country. I'm not going anywhere. Now, DeSantis' problem is he's done a really terrible job campaigning, 
and the people advising him have done a really bad job. They've done a better job as of late, but it's kind of too little too late. He came out of the gates and was incredibly weak. And that announcement on Twitter, I mean, from the get-go, the whole thing was just, it, it just bombed out. And they thought that they could just play culture warrior and become the nominee, and it wasn't working. And it became very evident very quickly it wasn't working, but they thought it would work. And they doubled down on it. And it hasn't worked. And his campaign has been better as of late. But, man, you got to come out strong. And he didn't come out strong. Whereas Nikki Haley, like, I'm not the biggest Nikki Haley fan, but she's she's been good in the debates. And she has exceeded my expectations by a mile. So, listen, Trump, DeSantis, Haley, those three should be the only ones left. Let the chips fall where they may. But if you really want to find an alternative, then it has to be one-on-one. And at this point, they should just flip a coin, you know, go to midfield like an NFL game, flip a coin between Haley and DeSantis. And, you know, one picks heads, one pick tails, the loser drops out. Uh, That seems as good a way as any to do it at this point. (laughs) Oh, boy. 828 on a uh, Monday. Where are we at on uh, the rumors of five billion dollars in local taxes for the Royals new stadium? Plus, Travis Kelsey has a new barbecue line. What's going on there? All next. Got a lot of good barbecue in this town, but apparently now you got to have another option. Travis Kelsey's Kitchen. You buying this? Travis Kelsey's Kitchen. Yeah. Walmart is selling Kelsey's new barbecue line that is going to be sold under the aforementioned name. Seven different meal options for Travis Kelsey. All right? I know you don't want to talk about the game last night, so let's talk about Travis's Kitchen, John. Daily Mail didn't have that being bust in, did they? No, they didn't. They had Jack Stack Jack getting bust in. It seemed like. Yeah. What happened? Why didn't they bust in the guy's own barbecue line that he's launching? That would have been a good time to do it, by the way, with the paparazzi sitting outside his house last weekend. But uh, here's the list of entrees that are available. Going to be at Walmart between uh, 817 and 1278, depending on the item. Now, this is only at Walmart. Here we go. Bacon mac and cheese. Dish features jumbo macaroni noodles and a cheddar cheese sauce with pieces of bacon sprinkled throughout. Brisket burnt ends and barbecue sauce. Taste of these burnt ends was described as smoky and caramelized. Brisket burnt ends with mac and cheese. Dish has chunks of burnt ends and jumbo macaroni noodles blended together in a cheddar cheese sauce. Sliced brisket in a barbecue sauce. Dish is sliced... uh, brisket with a traditional Kansas City style barbecue sauce. Barbecue beans with sausage, barbecue uh, barbecue baked black beans, and white kidney beans with brown sugar, onion, pork, sausage, and bacon. Also on the list from Travis's Kitchen, sausage and meatball marinara with peppers and onions. Sliced pork sausage, pork and beef meatballs topped with marinara sauce, bell peppers, and onions. And then barbecue baked beans with burnt ends. Baked black beans and white kidney beans meet Kansas City-style burnt ends topped with brown sugar, peppers, bacon, and onions. Anything stand out there for you guys on the Travis Kelsey kitchen lineup being sold at Walmart? No, sir. (laughs) No, thank you. (laughs) Bacon mac and cheese sounds interesting to me. I'd try it. Oh, okay. Well, maybe we got to do a taste test here in the studios. I got to tell you if it's like above Casey's Pizza, below filet of fish I got to figure out where this Travis Kelsey barbecue line stacks up, John. I wonder what the recipe for bacon mac and cheese is. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I couldn't do that one at home myself. Yeah, well, you know, I'll tell you what. um, The the prices are, I know it's Walmart, but the prices aren't bad. Yeah. I saw the price is eight seventeen to twelve seventy eight, depending on the item. It's not terrible. It's not terrible. Not selling me with the white kidney bean thing. Well, I yeah. agree with you there. I Don't agree. The, uh, what is it? The pinto beans? Or, yes. Yeah, no. I'm with you. Um, yes. What I want to know is whether or not Kelsey's personal chef is getting any love for this Travis Kelsey's kitchen line, or if it's just basically. You know, some knockoff uh, barbecue brand put Travis's name on it and they get to sell it at Walmart. Something tells me it's the latter, but whatever. I I might have to try it. I'm with, uh, well, you know what I'm most intrigued by? Brisket burnt ends with mac and cheese. uh, That, if I'm going to try one of these things out of the gates, 
that would be my go-to. I'll give it a shot and see how it comes out, John. I don't know. Maybe like a good cardboard dough <laughs> or something about in a box. You're not it's digging kinda, it. I don't know about barbecue in a box. You're just leery of Wine the whole thing. in a box, though. Yeah, so I yeah. Guess. slap the bag, baby. We all did that back in the heyday, right? I'm imagining there's not anything particularly unique about it. Uh, correct. Perhaps a little more generic food for 50 type recipe. I agree. I mean, this is also like buying um, uh, boxed macaroni noodles mm -hmm. when you're in Staten Island or something like that. You know, <laughs> uh, why, why subject yourself to it is yeah. your broader point. So I'll give you that. I will. But I saw it. I was like, geez, this is convenient. One week after he's got Jack Stack. Uh, catering his uh, after party against the Chargers with Taylor Swift in town. He's got his own barbecue line at Walmart. So go figure. Go figure. David Slater, Clay County Economic Council, is going to be here in 10 minutes. And I want to ask him about all this drama happening in Jackson County. Because late last week, as you heard us talk about on the show, there was a conveniently leaked report that said Jackson County taxpayers could be on the hook for billions of dollars, billions with a B, for a Royals new stadium downtown. Now, where did this leaked report come from? It went to the Kansas City Star, and I believe it came from Frank White's office. And that is the social media speculation as well. That Frank White, deep down, doesn't really want the Royals to stay in Jackson County, potentially. So his office is leaking these reports conveniently to the Kansas City Star saying any new ballpark would not cost the taxpayers $1 billion, but instead would cost actually $5 billion. So uh, Woke KCUR, that's the uh, National Panhandler radio affiliate here in town, uh, they put out a report on this over the weekend saying the document projects huge tax collections based on several assumptions of how sales tax revenues would grow over 40 years. But where those numbers came from and whether voters would renew a sales tax for the Royals is still unknown. They write here, the document from the office of Jackson County Executive Frank White is hypothetical and a projection of how much a downtown stadium would cost Jackson County through different revenue streams. It makes several assumptions Primary among them, that voters will approve extending the current 3 cent sales tax that funds Kauffman and Arrowhead Stadiums until 2071. Money collected from that sales tax is split evenly between the Chiefs and the Royals. So that's part of where that projection comes from, as KCUR obtained that document. Uh, without getting too far in the weeds, because you really don't care about that, the bigger picture here is what this does to the negotiation. Clay County looked like it was falling behind the eight ball a couple of weeks back. When the Royals announced that they wanted to extend their deadline, remember, the Royals were supposed to tell the public in late September where they wanted their stadium to be, either in downtown or in North Kansas City. They then put out a statement at the end of the month, last month, saying, eh, you know, that deadline, we're going to have to wait. We're going to push that back. And they never brought up a new deadline. Here we are a month later. It's going to be November on Wednesday. And we have no idea what's going on with this negotiation. None whatsoever. But it did look to me like Jackson County was taking the lead again. There were more conversations with Jackson County and the Royals. Kansas City was getting in the mix as well. And suddenly things had gotten awfully quiet out of Clay County. And rumors had started, things I had started hearing, is that basically Clay County was not going to give the amount of sales tax dollars to the Royals that they wanted for the ballpark up there. So the Royals may have been driven back into the arms of Jackson County. So all this leads us to late last week, when suddenly out of nowhere, out of thin air, this report drops that forget $1 billion for the taxpayer, Try $5 billion from the taxpayer to the Royals. Who would leak that to the Kansas City Star? Somebody who secretly doesn't want the Royals staying there. And the only person that I can come to a conclusion on that being is Frank White. That's it. 
We know he's got beef with the Royals going back years after his playing days. That's nothing new. Uh, He has not been obviously very transparent as a county executive either. So it all ties right back to his office and points right back to his office. And by the way, Quentin Lucas is not happy about it. He put out some tweet over the weekend saying like, you know, you guys are going to lose the Chiefs as well for this county, which I don't think is the case. But point is, he's not happy. So David Slater uh, has been working not behind the scenes, but also uh, on the front lines on behalf of Clay County trying to get the Royals up north. And he is going to be here to react to all this drama in Clay County. Coming up next on KCMO Talk Radio, now on your FM dial at 95.7.